Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you all for joining us today. We have folks from 10 U.S. states and two countries on the webinar, and SAIS is thrilled and honored to be able to make this information available to as wide an audience as possible. I'm Damian Cavanaugh, Vice President of Accreditation and Membership at SAIS. In this SAIS Lunch and Learn, we turn our attention to governance and a look at the methodology and findings from researchers out of Vanderbilt's Peabody College of Education and Human Development. As their capstone doctoral project, our presenters join together to review measures of effectiveness of independent school boards of trustees. In 2013, NAIS published a governance study called Heads and Boards Working in Partnership. This study, which was an update from a study conducted in 2006, established and confirmed baselines for a variety of common practices by analyzing the frequency of those practices in schools. For example, the study shows that 80% of board members have a three-year term of service and 98% of those terms are renewable. There are hundreds of data points in the NAIS study related to demographics, practices, satisfaction, and perceptions. Our presenters today worked with NAIS and used their framework to begin to understand the statistically valid relationships between common practices and the strategic effectiveness of boards and heads, helping us all to differentiate between what are common practices and what truly might be best practices. Their methodology also led them to key findings that debunk several accepted practices that have little or no correlation with strategic effectiveness, thus helping to demonstrate that sacred cows do in fact make the best burgers. It is my great pleasure to introduce you today to Dr. Troy Baker, Director of Athletics at Pace Academy in Atlanta, Georgia, Dr. Stephen Campbell, Assistant Head of Upper School and Director of International Programs at Lausanne Collegiate School in Memphis, Tennessee, and Dr. Dave Ostroff, Director of the Tad Bird Honors College at All Saints Episcopal School in Fort Worth, Texas. Gentlemen? Welcome to everyone. Uh, we appreciate you uh, taking the time to, to learn a little bit more about our study, and we look forward to interacting with you today. Our, our initial question, uh, one of the initial questions that, that guided our study from NAIS uh, was, was how to assess the effectiveness of boards uh, to identify best practices and, and to try to provide uh, thought uh, for future improvement and, and perhaps some resources for heads of schools and board chairs uh, to use to evaluate their own performance but also to uh, affect the performance of their schools. Um, as, as we did a deep dive into governance, um, we, we came to a few conclusions, and, and, and one conclusion that we came to was that there was little to no uh, statistical evidence that any of the common practices um, were, were in fact true. Um, we found a lot of anecdotal evidence. Uh, we met with leading uh, consultants. Uh, we met with heads of schools, board chairs. Uh, we did a lot of background work um, and, again, a deep dive into governance to, just to try to discover what was there. And what we found was there was a void. Uh, there was a major void in terms of statistical evidence uh, to back up these claims and to back up best practices. So what we wanted to do was to try to find a way first to even identify what we meant by board effectiveness. So when we talk about assessing a board, we were left with the question where we said, assessing a board for what? Um, what, what does it mean to be a quote unquote effective board? So what we did was, was we came up um, through, through our research and all signs pointed towards the need to be strategic in nature, uh, the need to refrain from tactical in favor of the long term, uh, and the need to identify long term trends and, and to think about the school's future uh, 5, 10, 25, and sometimes 30 years into the future. Um, for our strategic effectiveness metric, um, each school basically received a rating uh, from 1 to 4, and that rating was basically uh, calculated through our survey instrument that we sent to heads of schools and board chairs throughout all of NAIS's membership. Um, as you see in the figure in front of you, uh, we, we divided uh, components of the board into characteristics, structures, and activities. Um, and just to summarize what those mean, characteristics, it's basically a snapshot of the actual board. Um, it's almost like taking a picture of, of who's in the room. It's their backgrounds, it's the percentage of parents in the room. 
Um, it is the amount of money the people around the room make, their capacity to give. It's the number of people in the room, whereas structures are things that you may find in a document. Uh, those are the policies. Um, those are committee structures, uh, term limits, things of that nature. And the activities uh, are basically what's being done, um, what's happening in the meetings, um, how do we bring people into the board, uh, how do we develop them. And the three of those components together we feel really encompass uh, the, the facets of board work and what a board is all about. Um, and most importantly, institutional performance is the so what. Um, so, so we say these numbers are great. It's great to talk about strategic effectiveness. It's great to talk about term limits and all of these other things. But the bottom line is that heads of schools and board chairs, they want to know how to move the needle. Um, they, they want to know how do I actually influence uh, the performance of the school that I serve. Um, and that's, that's what this graphic represents. Initially, our, our, our biggest and perhaps most controversial finding, uh, which is why we want to start with it, is the percentage of trustees who are current parents has min minimal effect on strategic effectiveness of a board. Um, in order to, 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 really, to really test this finding and to test this notion, um, we wanted to not only uh, inquire about how many current parents were on a board and test for relationships between that school's strategic effectiveness rating and the number of parents they had on a board, but we also wanted to think about whether or not schools that have preferences or policies about the number of parents on a board had different measures of strategic effectiveness. And what we found through our statistical analysis was that there was there was no correlation, no relationship uh, between percentage of parents on a board, preferences, or policies. Um, and what we actually found was that was that other factors matter more. So when we, again, were initially somewhat surprised uh, by the fact that we did not find any statistical evidence to support the claim, uh, we decided to dive a little deeper. We decided to probe more deeply and engage in qualitative analysis. Uh, to kind of uncover the story behind the numbers. Um, so we took a mixed, met mixed methods approach, which again was something we did not find in the literature um, because we wanted to again tell the story behind the numbers. And what we found from heads of schools and board chairs, they were more concerned with um, a trustee's capacity to influence the culture of giving, um, the level of expertise of the people around the room, and whether or not the people around the table could work together. Um, and, and we'll explain a little bit of that a little bit more in detail as we move on, uh, but essentially there's a big difference between a trustee's capacity to give and a trustee's capacity to influence the culture of giving. Again, we'll get into a little bit of that later, but that was a very important distinction uh, that we found uh, through our qualitative analysis with heads of schools and board chairs. And when we talk about a group of experts, one of the difficult uh, things for heads of school is that they are typically the only person in the room uh, who's an educational expert. Um, and that, that presents a very, very complex principal agent uh, dynamic um, in which the board chair, is, is the head of school, is responsible um, for bringing that educational perspective into the room. However, it's important to have a wide range of skills, of skill sets around the table. Uh, for instance, we, we spoke with several heads of schools and board chairs who were engaging in capital campaigns and had to make decisions about the people that, that they elected or brought in to serve on the board um, who had expertise in perhaps construction or expertise in any given project that they saw on the horizon. Um, and, and we felt that that was one of the things that was, in fact, a lot more important than whether or not a trustee was a current parent. Um, and then collaboration. Um, and, and that's more about, you know, do they have the ability to suspend their po personal motivation? Do they have the ability uh, to think long term? Um, and do they have the ability to uh, work together uh, with, with the other people around the table? So what, what we found is that many boards engage in an, in an orientation process um, in which it's, it's a one-time event. It may be a weekend, um, it may be one day, and in some cases it may be an entire week um, in which you bring uh, new trustees and in some way kind of give them a, a short-term indoctrination 
uh, into their role as a trustee. Um, but what we found was that uh, the, the actual boards who engaged in a very intentional onboarding process uh, had a tendency to rate higher in terms of strategic effectiveness than those boards who did not. Um, so what we mean by onboarding is it's, it's a long term, it's a deliberate process, um, it has to do with um, protecting the culture of the board um, and, and talking about who's responsible for protecting that culture, uh, what their roles are in that process, um, choices that are made in terms of professional development, um, the way that new trustees are cultivated and invited into the process of being a trustee. Um, and, and also about how, how well a board perpetuates itself. Um, so we found that those factors actually did have strong statistical, uh, statistically significant relationships with a board strategic effectiveness. And what we found is in the, in the schools in, in, that rated the highest in strategic effectiveness, um, uh, this sentiment expressed on the slide uh, kind of is emblematic of, of, of what we found with, with the vast majority of, of heads of school and board chairs that we spoke with is that they actually preferred to have more parents. They preferred to have more current parents on the board. Um, they said things like, there's no way we could get this level of commitment um, from people who are not current parents. They said things like there's there's no way we could have a room of people who understood the culture of the school um, it, so well and so deeply uh, if they were not current parents. Um, so we found everything from 75 percent to 90 percent and there were some that that would say we're very comfortable having a hundred percent current parents on the board as long as our onboarding process is solid as long as we continue to protect our board's culture, uh, we feel we will be more successful uh, with people who understand the school and have a deeply vested interest in the school. Again, just take a few moments to read that slide. And once again, this is this is the so what. Um, this is the bottom line. Um, as as we engaged in the in the study again, uh, we we were very pleased with the data we collected. Um, we were uh, informed and enlightened by the qualitative data that we collected and the interviews that we had, uh, the time we spent with heads of schools and board chairs. Um, but we were charged also with providing guidance. Per providing uh, strategies and providing best practices uh, for, for NAIS member uh, heads of schools and board chairs uh, around the world. And, and one of the things that we, um, we were very intentional about was making sure that by the end of this study, we had not only identified uh, statistically significant relationships or debunked myths or confirmed assumptions, uh, but that we also were able to provide heads of schools and board chairs and practitioners uh, with solid, statistically grounded information on what actually moves the needle. Um, so answering the question, what can heads of schools, board chairs, and trustees do to positively influence the outcomes of the institutions they serve? Um, and in the gray box, we've got a few definitions. Um, admissions demand. This is about our marketing department. This is about our admissions department and our outreach. It's the ability to engage the community. Um, it's all about branding. It's all about reputation. Um, it's, it's the word of mouth. It's um, the number of people that are interested in applying for your school, that, are, um, that understand your school's mission, your brand, and your identity. The culture of giving has, has less to do with how much money is actually raised and more to do with the level of buy-in of the key stakeholders. Again, this harkens back to uh, the trustees' capacity to influence the culture of giving. Um, and that has less to do with how much they can give and more to do with how much they can engage the community. Um, one board chair said it best when, when he said, I believe that if we are transparent, if we make our thinking transparent and clear, if people trust us and if we own up for our mistakes, 
that they will be more inclined to give and they will be more inclined to invest and they will be more inclined to trust us uh, when, when we come to them asking for gifts. Um, they will be more inclined to trust us uh, when we launch into a capital campaign if our thinking has been made transparent and we can show evidence of a great process we believe that people will be more inclined to give and they will be more inclined to buy in. Um, in terms of culture of giving, uh, in terms of the role of a trustee, uh, many board chairs and, and heads of school also express the need to have trustees who are comfortable engaging in those types of conversations. Um, what, what we often find is that sometimes uh, trustees are, are brought into a, a, a new board or, or occupy a position on a board and they're kind of made to believe that one of their key functions is to give. And while we still think that it's important for our trustees to be our leaders in terms of giving, um, we also found that heads of schools and board chairs that rated highly on strategic effectiveness, they also made a point of um, reiterating to trustees that a part of their role was also uh, to, to raise the level of buy-in from other stakeholders uh, so that their duties went beyond uh, their pocketbook, so to speak, um, and more to their ability to build those relationships, uh, to, to build more trust in the board. And that's everything from being visible, uh, being accessible, being great communicators, being approachable, um, building relationships with current parents um, and faculty and staff and administration. And, and in the schools that rated highly in strategic effectiveness, um, part of their onboarding process was that constant reminder of what those responsibilities entail. Enrollment health, again, this is, a, this is a snapshot. This is how many vacant seats are in the school, um, how many students are in the seats. And as we all know, one of, one of the major jobs for heads of schools um, is, is to make sure seats are filled. Um, so in terms of enrollment health and admissions demand, uh, that's the distinction between the two. Enrollment health is more of a, stat, a snapshot and admissions demand uh, is, is living. It's, it's alive. It, it changes from day to day, week to week. Um, financial strength, uh, very, very important. Um, also in terms of the committee structure, um, this is where we talk about the people that we, we, we want to serve on our finance committee. Um, we, we're talking about assets and endowment. Um, we're talking about the way that we manage our, our budget. Um, do, do we have long-term plans for our budget? Are we putting out fires? Um, and then we're just talking about the overall financial well-being of, of the school as a whole. That's your cash reserves. Um, that is whether or not you can, can uh, provide competitive salaries, uh, benefits, and things of that nature. So, so basically all things financial. Um, and through all of that, what we found was there's, there's a relationship between um, how often a board spends time discussing matters that will affect the school five or more years into the future and that school's institutional performance. So in short, the schools that spent more time um, talking about long-term goals, uh, predicting long-term challenges, actually were able to move the needle more for the schools that they served. Um, one example of that is a head of school that we spoke with um, who, who really focused on um, the fact that the, their school may have an enrollment management problem within the next five to seven years. Uh, currently that school is at a seven applicants uh, to every vacancy and while on the surface in the, in the short term that's a wonderful problem to have. As, as a head of school I'm sure that uh, many of you or even a board chair many of you would say if, if, if I've got admissions demand of seven to one uh, we're in a great position. Um, our admissions demand is high, our enrollment health is high, uh, but at the same time their, their board was engaging in, in conversations about um, what would happen within the next five to seven years um, if they did not increase the size of their pre-k and first grade programming and what impact that would have on the upper school uh, 10 to 12 years into the future. Uh, so that board was, was engaged in conversations about enrollment management problems that may be on the horizon um, during a time when, when in fact uh, admissions demand is high and, and all signs say that admissions is very healthy. Uh, but I think that that board uh, engaged in that process continuously and, and continues to move the needle uh, for their school. Um, 
the second relationship that we found um, is that schools that oftentimes, as much as we want to talk about being strategic and thinking into the future, uh, we also have to be realistic, and we also have to understand that that as trustees and heads of school, um, you have to operate in the present as well. Um, you, you have to take care of immediate business. Uh, but the schools that were able to actually influence their institutional performance um, in a positive way, they use their long-range priorities to guide their short-term decisions. Um, and I know that seems like common sense, but the heads of school and board chairs that we spoke with basically told us that they spent a lot of time engaging with their strategic plan. So when they had decisions to make in the short term, all of the decisions they made uh, reverted back to the strategic plan. So in short, every one of the trustees, heads of schools, and board chairs had a deep understanding of the strategic plan, and that was a document uh, that was routinely placed in front of the group um, again, to guide decision making uh, for those individual boards. And thirdly, um, heads of schools, board chairs, and trustees also reported that uh, the more time they spent uh, thinking about long term concerns and, and the less time they spent engaging in short term concerns um, resulted in, in higher institutional performance. Some of this is, is all about delegation, it's all about uh, the board being able to be honest with themselves and ask questions like, should we be engaging in this conversation right now? Is this a conversation for the upper school head and the head of school? Um, really understanding their roles and being very careful um, not to cross the line too far into the tactical and the immediate. So it's, it's, it's those anecdotes like, um, you know, we, we don't need trustees trying to fire the Spanish teacher. Um, it's, it's being able to manage um, parent conversations and understand where your role begins and ends as a trustee. Um, one, one head of school des described the, the role of a trustee as an embattled position. Um, he said it's an embattled position uh, because you have to consistently communicate confidence in the school, confidence in the decisions that are being made, but also the more accessible and visible you make yourself, um, obviously that, that correlates to um, more conversations, uh, more complaints, more individuals um, coming to you with, with their real-time concerns that are very important and understanding as a trustee um, how to delegate, um, understanding how to say, you know, that is a great question, but that's more of a question for our head of school um, and resisting that urge uh, to jump in and help right away. And this is not a question of control. Um, what, what was related to us was this was uh, more of an issue of having trustees that are so willing and eager to help and having trustees um, who, who's so, who are so eager uh, to make a difference in their school that sometimes they will try to solve real-time issues um, rather than delegating them to the right person. So again, this also relates back to that onboarding process of letting um, trustees know where their role ends and where they begin. And also this is uh, further complicated by having current parents um, serving as trustees, when as we all know, um, you're, you're going to wear several hats. As we know in a lot of independent schools, um, we have close-knit communities. Um, they spend time with one another outside of school at social events, and when you are the trustee at the parent social um, at cocktail hour and people want to approach you with real-time issues, um, Boards that spend a lot of time going through those scenarios, um, role playing, things of that nature, seem to do a much better job of refraining from the tactical and actually influence the inst influencing the institutional performance of the schools they serve. Moving on to uh, the financial component of institutional performance, um, again, heads of schools, board chairs, and boards that, that focus their budget conversations on whether, they out, whether or not their decisions are aligned with the strategic plan than they do about kind of real-time numbers. Um, so, so they talk about um, you know, reviewing and approving the annual budget um, 
within the context of long-term concerns. Um, and, and again, this may sound like one of those common sense findings, um, but when we talked to heads of schools and board chairs, uh, we found it was a bit more nuanced than, than we initially thought. Um, so there are times when, when you know, heads of schools have expressed to us that decisions were made um, that at the moment may have seemed risky or at the moment um, may have not um, put them in, in a positive situation financially uh, with the understanding that the adherence to the strategic plan was actually better for the long term. Um, and also boards who, who spent more time conducting long-term financial planning seem to move the needle a bit more. And, and what that basically boils down to is um, in, in their board meetings, in their finance committee meetings, um, being careful to, to monitor how much time was actually being spent on balancing the books um, for that year versus thinking about um, where they were five years prior to, uh, where they are now, where they see themselves in five, 10, 15 years down the road. Um, looking at trends in the market, looking at birth rates, looking at real estate, um, looking at real estate values in the area, um, analyzing uh, enrollment trends in, in surrounding schools, um, analyzing trends uh, nationwide for independent schools, thinking about their value proposition as a school, um, decisions to raise and lower tuition um, which are hot button issues, um, I would say annually for, for a large percentage of independent schools around the country. Um, when heads of schools and board chairs reported that when their decisions about raising, lowering, or maintaining their tuition price point, um, when they were guided by their neighboring schools, um, sometimes they said they, they, they feel like they made some mistakes. However, when, when they were guided by uh, conversations about the long-term viability of their school, uh, they felt as though their decisions were, were more sound. Uh, the data supports that. Um, the data that we collected and analyzed supports it. Uh, but, but more importantly, the, the, the qualitative data, uh, again, gives us, gives us a little bit more information to uncover the story behind those numbers. Well, we are all anticipating um, a rich dialogue with you all. Um, and, and we welcome any questions that you may have. Um, what, what's in front of you here are just a couple um, infographics um, summarizing some of our findings. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm not going, going to read those to you, uh, but if, if you will read through those, that, that just kind of summarizes uh, some of what we've covered today. Uh, but again, I was, I was intentional in moving through the slides very, fairly rapidly um, in anticipation of, of your questions. Uh, concerns or, or any additions that, that you'd like to make on what we've covered today. Um, it's very, very important to us um, that you all have an opportunity to, to have your questions answered. It's very important to us uh, that this hour that we spend together today um, is, is indeed worth your time and, and that you have the time uh, to, to discuss concerns and questions with us. Um, I want to go ahead and get the ball rolling. You, you talked um, extensively about uh, onboarding, um, and one of the things that you said is is just sort of a question about who who's responsible for protecting the culture of the school. Is there anything that you all noted in your in your research or in your conversations, either the qualitative um, or the quantitative, that that really relates the idea of school culture to school mission or core values? So some of the some of the terms that we use just to try to get them uh, a little bit in order. And can you speak to that a little bit? Yes, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and, and, and with that, I'll, I'll, I'll give a little bit of context um, uh, uh, before I answer. Uh, what, one of our heads of school basically stated to us that um, they have avoided hiring outside consultants um, for strategic planning and things of that nature. Um, and, and he kind of expressed that he, he felt as if there were times when, when he's, he's read literature, attended conferences, things of that nature, and he's been made to feel that uh, there, there's a large contingency out there that, that feels as though uh, their role is to assist um, heads of school in getting their board chair to do what they want them to do. 
Um, so it's almost like it's an adversarial relationship. And their selling point is we're going to come in and we're going to help you um, get these people to do what you want them to do. Hmm. Um, and, and, and you get uh, – that's where some of the assumptions come in about – the percentage of current parents, right? Because it's there's this assumption that there's no way that current parents can suspend their personal motivation, and if, you, if you've got too many of them in the room, there's no way as a head of school you're going to be able um, to really get them to understand the culture of the school and suspend their personal motivation um, and avoid the tactical in favor of the strategic. Um, and he said, he basically said, I don't, I don't find any, any any meaning in that. I don't find any merit um, in that assumption um, because he said we've, we've worked so hard to get to the point where everyone does understand the culture of the school. And I think that the one of the most important, well perhaps the most important relationship is the relationship between the head of school and the board chair. Mm -hmm. And I say all that to say that the head of school and the board chair are are truly the ones responsible uh, for communicating that culture, uh, for assuring uh, mission alignment with decisions that are made, um, and, and for creating a culture in the board within the board um, that allows you know trustees to, to challenge one another, um, that allows trustees to redirect one another, and and quote unquote at times to even police one another. Uh, but that tone has got to be set uh, by the head of school and the board chair. There's a, 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 a I, this is Stephen Campbell. If I could add something to that, one of the big ways that we feel like um, a lot of the schools protect their board culture is through the very, very careful cultivation of new trustees. Um, we met with schools that would invite trustees to serve, uh, potential trustees to serve on a task force before they're invited to be on the board. Uh, they have lunches, they have conversations, and um, uh, there's a very, very thorough vetting process to make sure that this potential trustee will buy into the board culture um, when they join the board. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a great point, uh, Stephen. And, and uh, another another one of the reasons that uh, there there was we, we found so much buy-in um, uh, for the for that process is that um, trustees also wanted to get an opportunity uh, to to assess. Uh, potential trustees' ability um, to to work together with the group, um, so it was almost a, uh, for lack of a better term, a tryout in a sense, um, just to see how an individual would would function with the group uh, before formally inviting them to be a trustee. Um, because I, what was reported to us is all too often um, someone was would be invited to be a trustee because of their uh, capacity to give or because of their professional skill set, only to find out that um, that, that individual was, was not successful in working with the group and, and respecting and understanding the board's culture. Um, so, so by inviting them uh, to serve on committees before, before formally inviting them to be a trustee, it also gave them an opportunity uh, to see how they would blend with the group um, and to see what they could truly add to the group, but, but more importantly, to see if they would um, uh, detract uh, from 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 the positive culture of, of, of their current boards. So let me go ahead and interject because there's a question that's uh, that's been posed here that I think really really gets at some of the heart of the the culture of the board. The question is um, the question is did you look at best practices for onboarding with regard to maintaining the culture of the board? And as you um, as you address that that question, um, I'd love for you also to dig into a little bit between. The differences that you've that you're that you're pointing out between the board culture and the the culture of the of the school as a whole, and any any connection uh, between those two as well. Okay. Um, thanks for the question, Damien. Dave Ostroff here from from All Saints in Fort Worth, and and I would I would add two points to to address this question. One is that our statistical analysis finds that it that the duration um, matters most. So when, when we think about onboarding versus orientation, um, we're suggesting that um, the, a, a longer arc of onboarding versus a one-off or shorter arc of orientation um, makes a meaningful difference. 
And the second point is when we ask sort of what does this process look like, um, our, our finding um, sort of works around the theme of um, deliberately structuring onboarding around shaping new trustees' understandings of their roles within the broader school community as well as um, in the context of their responsibilities as board members. So you know, to your follow-up question, maybe it's, it's, a, it's a both and. Um, Um, some of the other questions, there are, there are a lot of great questions that are being posed here. Um, this next one to go ahead and, and uh, address is, is uh, a little bit more specific. Based on your study, are there suggestion, suggestions for most effective committees that impact institutional performance? Hi, uh, this is Stephen Campbell at Los Angeles Collegiate School um, in Memphis, Tennessee. We found that um, probably the most effective committee for uh, impacting institutional performance has been the governance committee. So the committee that's in charge of, um, of uh, guiding the process of um, uh, cultivating the new trustees and onboarding them into the school. Um, every school that we talked to had a finance committee um, in that um, uh, helped sort of guide that 10 year outlook at the financial health of the school. Um, and um, we also had schools that were very much that had, um, if they were going into a capital campaign or something, they had a building committee. So a committee that sort of um, talked about how that would look in the future. Very few schools had a had committees related to um, the academic progress of the school, to um, sort of the academic identity of the school. Um, the, the board had a much broader view than that. So did you? Yes. Did you find? No, that I'm, the... I'm sorry, uh, uh, Dave Ostroff here. Just, just quickly, um, with regard to the statistical analysis in our study, um, we identified eight committees that are associated with heightened strategic effectiveness. Um, as Stephen mentioned, uh, governance or nominating is one of those. Um, development, executive, buildings and grounds, strategic planning, diversity, finance, and head of school evaluation are others that in, in our analysis um, we found to, that there's a, a relationship between um, the use of these committees and heightened strategic effectiveness. Yes, and that, that's um, um, a, a, a wonderful question. That's a, that's a great question about committees. Um, and, and again, another, another wonderful part of our, our qualitative exploration was, was to get an opportunity um, to really get some examples of the way that heads of schools and board chairs viewed their committees. And, and one of the things that was communicated to us is that it's, it's often more important uh, for committees to understand what their role is as a community and what their strength is as a community and what they actually bring. Um, and, and a head of school uh, from Boston summarized it uh, best for me when, when he said he, he views uh, the trustees and, and the board chair is being at the 30,000 foot level and he views himself as being on, on the ground level um, in the trenches with the troops and he views uh, the committees as, as kind of being on the mountaintops. Um, so, so he sees, he views his committees as a bridge between uh, being the educational expert and, and the head of the school and the actual trustees and, and he feels that it's the committee's job um, to kind of distill some very, very complex issues and very complex uh, concepts to, to take them uh, from the educational level to distill them in a way that makes sense so that, that by the time they're actually uh, presented to the board as a whole, um, that there's a working understanding that things have been vetted um, by the experts in their field um, and communicated to the trustees um, in, in such a way that it's highly supportive to the head of school. Um, so, so heads of school reported to us that, um, so again, not only did we find statistical significance, what, what, what we found that was also very important was that when heads of schools uh, viewed their committees as, as a resource and an asset and a support mechanism, um, 
schools schools were much more effective or boards were much more strategically effective. Um, so let's moving on just a little bit to some uh, some aspects of policy formation and another question. Um, how does the concept of delegation from board to admin play in with policy formation? Developing some school policy is the work of the board, but there's often overlap with the admin role. Is there a good source for a best practice in this area? I, you know, honestly, I don't. Um, I, I don't know if we could necessarily um, identify a, a kind of a single data point um, in, in in terms of in terms of how policy is created. Um, but again, um, what what our what our findings suggest is that. Um, a lot of this uh, harkens back to that important relationship between the head of school and and the board chair. Um, it, it also harkens back to the importance of uh, the committee structure. So, if if whatever policy we we may be discussing, um, kind of having that understanding between the educational expert and and the person charged with um, uh, the day to day operations of the school, um, whether or not they are able to utilize their board chairs and committees um, to, to communicate the, the spirit of the school and, and, and the, uh, the, the real-time uh, pulse of the school in, in such a way that, that allows um, policy formation to truly be aligned not only with the mission in the long term, but to also be aligned with um, uh, the current situation at hand in the school. Um, so, so really, again, we, we did not uh, identify a, a single best practice or, or you know, one or two uh, data points, uh, but for us it was it was more um, of this overall notion um, that heads of school have got to be working in partnership um, with their board chairs, and that relationship has to be open, and communication has to be frequent, um, and 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 followed by that is is the relationship between um, any any given committee. Um, and the head of school, and, and whether or not the head of school is able um, to, to communicate effectively, and whether or not that committee, um, if, if there's a committee that's charged with, with creating a policy uh, for the school, um, whether or not that committee is able uh, to really take that information from the head of school and, and, and complete that work in an effective manner uh, from a policy standpoint. Does that does that address the question, or, or, or did I, or, or did I miss part of that question? I think so, and we'll see if there's a follow-up question that's uh, posted um, about that. But um, moving on to a slightly different topic about uh, vetting on uh, and onboarding and vetting new board members. Two questions that are related to each other: Are business people better candidates for the board or education professionals? And then a second question is: In cultivating potential trustees, how important is the vetting of the spouse? Um, I, I'll get the, um, I'll address the spouse question first because I think that's um, that's a, this is a very good question actually, and it came up with a lot of the discussions that we had with heads of school. Um, a big part of being on a board of trustees are the parking lot conversations. So the conversations that that board is um, those members of the board are having with other parents, uh, parents outside the school, in the school. Uh, very often, social circles overlap um, everywhere, and what those conversations in the parking lot are like. And the spouse is a part of that. And um, so if, so the, the spouse um, is a part of the process and there should be consideration taken into that. Um, but I think it really rests with the actual board member, uh, the board trustee, how much, um, and that's part of the onboarding process. How much do you share with your spouse? What are those conversations like? Um, what what do you what do you talk about at home, and um, what is your spouse able to talk about outside, and uh, and how clearly defined is your role as opposed to the fact that your um, your spouse is a is a father or a mother of a child at the school, um, so it looks very different. So it should be a part of the process, but I think it's more important. We found that it was more important at the time part of the onboarding process of the trustee. And sort of make sure that those goals are defined. Okay. But let me take the other part of the question for us, uh, Damien. I, I would suggest that rather than than thinking about business background or education background, that um, our study finds that um, 
there are uh, two factors that, um, that matter. One is the capacity to influence the culture of giving in the school. And, and I would say that the wording there is intentional. It's not just about the capacity to give. Uh, it's also about the capacity to influence others to give. Hmm. So in, in that regard, um, education professionals who, who may or may not have the capacity themselves to be major donors um, might have the capacity to influence others um, to, to, uh, to give. That's the first factor. Second is the capacity to offer professional advice that serves the school's strategic context. And I would underscore the words strategic context because um, I, uh, I th we note in our, um, in our interviews uh, and our case studies that um, this work is highly contextual. So for example, one of the schools that I visited, <coughs> excuse me, is in the process of acquiring real estate around the campus um, with the uh, expectation that they will expand athletics facilities. Though that school um, was thinking about uh, finding uh, board potential board members who have some expertise in terms of negotiating real estate deals and um, and some expertise in um, developing campus master plans and and architectural design. So uh, I would say that the uh, the kinds of professional advice that each school needs as it imagines its strategic vision um, is. is highly contextual and uh, and it might be that the answer is um, uh, a mix of particular types of um, of expertise that might be found both in in uh, in the business world and among professionals from a variety of different contexts as well that, that's 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 a great um, uh, kind of synopsis of our of our findings um, and, and and to address that question further um, we think about things like term limits, um, and, and we think about uh, notions of, 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 of rotating those, those skill sets in and out of the board uh, based on current and future challenges. Um, so the short answer is it depends. Um, if you are a school that's in a, in a decision-making process of, of whether or not the school will adopt um, an IB program, or if you're in a school that um, is, is making decisions about uh, AP offerings or a, a number of, of different um, academic programs that they may adopt or, or may not or may uh, cut. Um, it may be important to have some education professionals on on your board of trustees. Um, but but as Dave said, if if you are engaging in a major capital campaign to build a new upper school, you, you may need a different uh, um, variety of skill sets on the board. Uh, but what we found that was most important is that. Uh, the strategic plan um, has to guide that process. When, when the strategic plan does not guide the process, when, when personalities guide the process, uh, we, we find that uh, we, we found that boards were not as effective um, in, in, in terms of influencing their, the, the culture of their school and the, and the outcomes. Uh, but when the, when the actual strategic plan uh, was the guide for the process, um, they, they made decisions on, on um, identifying, cultivating, and, and bringing in new trustees um, ba based on what they needed at the time. It, it was highly contextual. Um, so I, I, I hope those are uh, those answers address that question, but it's it's highly contextual and it depends. We've got a couple questions that are that are directly related to uh, development and fundraising. Um, I'm just going to read them both. I think they're interrelated. Could you say a little more about how trustees effectively influence a culture of giving? versus out-of-pocket giving. So often there's a great trustee candidate who might not have the personal resources to be a big donor. And then the second question is, um, we're in a small community of roughly 30,000 people. This often means the people who can influence giving for several different organizations are on multiple uh, boards um, and can feel the exhaustion and hesitation to basically ask the same donors to give to all the nonprofits. So any advice on overcoming that phenomenon um, and, and, uh, and any advice on how to relate it back to um, a great trustee candidate who might not be able to be a big donor themselves. 
Um, I'm, I'm going to sort of lead with the, the first question, but with an example. Um, so we, 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 I, am, I work at a, a fairly international school, and, and we've so spoken with other international schools. And the culture of giving in um, international schools is just very, very different than it is in, um, in your American schools. And um, a process of um, a board trustee to be able to influence the, cap the capacity of giving is the engagement in um, other parents and other stakeholders in the community, sort of educate them as to the needs of the school, as to the mission of the school, sort of swing the needle um, towards the, the idea that tuition is not enough, that the school really needs more engagement on the financial level from all of its stakeholders, teachers included, right? Um, it just has to be an engagement um, on all members. And so it's, it's a process of education as well as a process of giving. Hey, I'd like to add a, just a, a couple of notes. We, we probed this concept of uh, trustees as a, as a fundraising body, and, um, and we found um, statistically significant um, effect on strategic effectiveness from requiring board members to make monetary contributions to the school. Um, and we found that you know, nearly three-quarters of the schools that we surveyed um, report um, sort of sharing a minimum contribution requirement as part of the identification and cultivation process for new trustees. Um, however, um, the way um, strategically effective schools describe that requirement, I think, is is meaningful. Um, they would uh, they would say something like, according to the board members' ability and capacity to give as their definition or their standard for defining a minimum contribution. Um, we find that um, a willingness and a capacity um, to, to both um, give and to um, fundraise or to have the desire to be engaged in fundraising um, themselves is, 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 a, is a part of this puzzle as well. And the, the notion that all board members are, are asked to give, um, but the critical piece is um, whether or not they are willing and able to ask others to give as well. Uh, we've got three questions, um, uh, three sort of final questions that I think we can wrap up with. The, the, the first couple is, uh, what, if anything, did you find regarding selective strategic use of ad hoc committees to address specific issues? And uh, what did you learn about uh, how often highly strategic boards engage in self-evaluation? So let's see if we can um, knock out those two questions uh, related to each other, and then we'll, we'll move on to the final question. Yeah, I think that the story about ad hoc committees that's powerful for, for me, for us, is, is seeing them as part of a process of cultivating new trustees, um, more so than um, seeing them as, as um, you know, moving a strategic agenda in a particular way. Um, you know, we looked more at process, and I think we would say that the other work is, is highly contextual. Then the other question was about uh, uh, strategic boards engaging in self-evaluation. How often? What form does it take? Things like that. Uh, we find that the most strategic, um, the schools that we found were uh, that ranked very highly in our strategic effectiveness metric, um, engaged in self-evaluation often. Uh, they, um, you know, there was always a process of reflection and contemplation on how how well they serve as a board, how strategic they are, how focused they are on strategic issues into the future as opposed to tactical issues in the present. Um, we found that a great majority of them uh, went through a process once a year, uh, be it a survey or um, um, someone coming in and helping them with it or just the, the school head leading them through that process, a board chair. Um, but it was, um, uh, it was a, it was a, a planned, frequent process. Hmm. It was it was planned and it was frequent. 
Um, but but the questions, I, I I think I think what's what's what was very important uh, to us was that um, it, it was the type of reflection, um, the type of evaluation that was happening. So it was less about um, reviewing and saying, okay, what's the financial health of health of the school? Um, it was less from an from an institutional outcome perspective, which I think is a natural function uh, for for many boards. Um, you know, the finance committee is is going to be very frequently involved in a in a process of of review and assessment. Um, but the true self evaluation for for boards uh, that was focused more on um, one example that was given to me was a review of the minutes. Um, when, when we review our minutes, um, how much time are we truly spending on things that are strategic in nature? Um, have we done a review of the mission of the school uh, for every board meeting that we have had? Uh, when we go back over our minutes, is there a review? Um, is the mission statement posted in front of every trustee at the beginning of every meeting? Uh, what is the head of school's role in, in maintaining the culture of the board? Um, how many times this year have we uh, been engaged in in a in a in a in a heated and contentious uh, conversation um, that basically uh, derailed uh, the the entire board meeting and what were the implications uh, on our performance as a board? So it was more of a review of their own process, uh, which I think is very different from a review of institutional performance markers, if if that makes sense. And then furthermore, what what I also what we also found is that um, what, what one of the things we, we, we came away with was that you know our study uh, we we feel like our the instrument that that we have created um, is actually a very useful tool and, and quite a few of the of the board board chairs and heads of school in the study um, were very very interested in, in learning more about the tool that we used. Um, uh, that they that they engaged in with us um, as an assessment tool for themselves. So I think there's a need um, in independent schools right now uh, for for a very useful tool that's grounded in statistical analysis uh, that goes beyond kind of an anecdotal uh, descriptive survey um, and something that really allows them uh, to to analyze their performance in a way that uh, gives them um, uh, some firm data for them to compare themselves with other schools. Uh, to compare them to their own performance um, year after year, and and we just we just feel like there was a there was there's really a need in the independent school community um, to to come up with a tool that actually measures the things that matter for boards. Um, and and quite frankly, we we don't we were not able to identify one, uh, which is why we created our own. Um, we're in conversations with uh, with the um, with the research team here about how to perhaps turn this around and make it more widely available, so that we can continue to to help schools uh, analyze their own strategic effectiveness. Thank you to everyone for attending and for your attention. A special thanks to our three presenters, Dr. Baker, Dr. Campbell, and Dr. Ostroff. Really, congratulations to you for moving the needle and continuing to push all schools into meaningful measures of strategic effectiveness. Um, as a note, uh, the, three, the three gentlemen will be presenting a longer version at the NAIS conference in San Francisco next week, and they'll also be attending the SAIS reception on Thursday evening, February 25th, so you can get a chance to meet them in person. I would like to invite everyone to, uh, to be sure to attend our upcoming uh, Lunch and Learn webinars on Friday, March 18th. We'll do a deep dive into the CWRA with representatives from three schools, from the Lovett School in Atlanta, Georgia, Greensboro Day School in Greensboro, North Carolina, and the Webb School in Bell Buckle, Tennessee. The three panelists will talk about their unique journeys with the CWRA and how their schools have been using the data gleaned to affect change. On Thursday, April 21st, a former head of school and assessment expert named Jonathan Martin will lead us through a look at different types of student proficiency measurements, how they're used and how they should be used. And Jonathan will also lead us through a process of discernment to turn the veritable vegetable soup of assessments available uh, into something that your school can bite off and chew. Please register at www.sais.org slash webinars. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you for our wonderful panelists. This is 
very important research. Um, and we would encourage anybody who has any way of influencing research, or if you're doing research on your own, to consider doing some something to further the, the field of study in independent schools and independent education. Thank you again, everyone. I uh, hope you have a, a wonderful afternoon. We appreciate it, and we will look forward to seeing you at an event in the future.